Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Potter Electric webinar on our addressable hardware. I have all of your microphones muted, so if you have any questions through the presentation, please enter them in the chat dialog, and I will take several breaks as we go through this to answer those questions. All right, so I'm James Brennan. I'm going to be your presenter today. Uh, I am the fire systems trainer here at Potter Electric, uh, and I've been in the industry over 15 years and done virtually every facet of this industry on the integration side. First, I want to talk about our addressable fire alarm panels. Potter has two different series of panels. We've got the IPA series of panels, which is going to be our proprietary line of panels. These panels are all listed for clean agent releasing, and they are UUKL listed for smoke control applications. We also have our AFC series of panels. That's our open series of panels that you could buy at any electrical or alarm distribution house like ADI, Alarm Max, SES, et cetera. Uh, these panels are going to be listed for clean, I'm sorry, for water-based releasing applications with the exception of the ARC100 that is listed for clean agent releasing. These panels are not UUKL listed for smoke control. I'm going to jump back to the previous slide here. The IPA60 is a panel that has a 5 amp power supply with two NACs and two input output circuits that can support a total of 60 SLC devices. It is not expandable past that number. The IPA100 can do a full loop of 127 SLC devices on that same 5 amp, 2 NAC, 2 IO PCB. On the bigger side, we've got the IPA4000. Out of the box, it can do a full loop of 127 SLC points, but using SLC expansion cards, it is expandable up to 4,064 total SLC devices. It has a much larger power supply, 10 amp power supply, and on board it has six NACs and four IOs. Uh, so as we move through the presentation, I'm gonna stop really referring to model numbers. I'm gonna talk about small panels and large panels. Small panels being the IPA60, IPA100, you know, 5 amp, 2 NAC, 2 IO. And then large panels being like that IPA4000, 10 amp power supply, 6 NACs, and 4 IOs. That SLC limitation is going to be based on firmware. Now, when we jump back to the AFC series, you'll see the AFC50 is going to be locked at 50 SLC devices. And it's on that, on that small format PCB, 5 amp, 2 NAC, 2 IO. AFC 100 can do a total of 100 SLC devices on that small format panel, 5 amp, 2 NAC, 2 IO. And same with the ARC 100, 100 SLC devices. The difference between those two being the AFC cannot do clean agent releasing. The ARC is a non-proprietary clean agent panel. The AFC 1000 can do a full loop of 127 devices out of the box, and it is expandable up to nearly 1,300. Expandable up to 1,270 SLC devices. It also has a 10 amp, 6 NAC, 4 IO power supply, uh, just like we saw on the IPA 4000. So again, the IPA series is going to be our proprietary line. You need to be a Potter ESD or Engineered Sales Distributor. And the AFC series is our non-proprietary line that you can get over the counter uh, at many electrical and alarm distribution warehouses. So here's a look at the large format panel there. We'll start off, it's got a four by 40 LCD screen. It's got a large screen built onto that built-in enunciator. Uh, up in the top right-hand corner, we have the PCOM connection. That's gonna be our ethernet port that we can do for, we can use for IP central station reporting. We're gonna program through that port. We can even do some emails through that port. Next to that, we've got our I.O. circuits. If those circuits are used as outputs as opposed to inputs, they have a one amp circuit rating as an output. And there's four of those I.O. circuits there on that large format control panel. Bottom left-hand corner, we have our system status relays, alarm, trouble, and supervisory. And of course, these are non-programmable Form C relays that just follow the current status of the panel. Moving to the right, we've got our battery charging terminals. And even further right, we have our six NACs. Those NACs are going to be rated as three amps for each one of those circuits. You know, again, keep in mind, total of a 10 amp power supply, 
IOs have a one amp circuit rating, NACs have a three amp circuit rating. To the right of that is our two P-Link connections. We're gonna talk about P-Link here in just a minute, but uh, P-Link is gonna be what we use to expand the capabilities of that control panel. And then last and certainly not least is gonna be our SLC down there in the bottom right-hand corner. Here's a look at the small format control panel. You'll notice down there on the bottom left is our battery charging terminals. Moving to the right of that is our alarm trouble and supervisory status relays. Going across is our two I.O. circuits, two NAC circuits, only one P-Link circuit as opposed to two that we'd see on the large format panel, and then finally our SLC. It is worth pointing out I.O. circuits can only ever be Class B. They cannot be made Class A. Currently, on those small format control panels, we have a 2 by 16 display. Uh, please keep in mind that is getting ready to change. Um, we have worked our way through UL and FM, and uh, there is going to be a 4 by 20 display that you're going to start seeing on these small panels here in the relatively near future. Top right corner is going to be that PCOM Ethernet port. Let's talk about panel installation. All of our panels have a 16 gauge sheet metal uh, door. Uh, the large panels have a removable dead front. That dead front is larger than the main enclosure. So you don't need to order a different enclosure if you have a flush mount application uh, because that, that dead front is larger. Of course, UL says we need to mount these panels on an interior wall and that's so that we can keep the operating temperature between 32 and 120 degrees Fahrenheit and our relative humidity below 85%. All of the enclosures have a keyhole in the top center there for easy mounting, and of course they all have knockout provided. Electrical spec, our panels will operate on 120 or 240 uh, VAC, and that is field selectable. There's a jumper uh, that we can make that adjustment with, but they do come out of the factory set at 120. Of course, NFPA says that we need to be uh, connected to a dedicated circuit, and those electrical terminals will accept up to 12 gauge wire. Let's take a closer look at those electrical connections. There's that jumper I was just telling you about, the 120-240 jumper selection. And then those electrical terminals are labeled B, W, and G, black, white, and green for hot, neutral, and ground. On the battery charging terminals, most, most of the time, we should see our charging voltage at 27.3 volts. If we see a lower, I apologize, if we see a lower voltage there, there may be a couple of things at play. We may have batteries that are very low because we've just come off battery service, or we potentially have a bad cell on a battery. Uh, of course, we're only going to be listed for sealed lead acid batteries. This is a life safety panel, so you cannot use lithium ion batteries on these. And the enclosure is deep enough to hold 8 or 18 amp hour batteries. It is not deep enough for 12 amp hour batteries. A charging circuit can charge a maximum of 55 amp hours of batteries. And of course, you need to complete a battery calculation to determine what size batteries you will need. You know, fire alarms are 24 volt systems and batteries are 12. So we're going to put those two batteries in series and then we would take those additional terminals and run that to that battery positive and negative terminal. I'm not seeing any questions on that portion, so I'm gonna go ahead and keep moving on. I wanna talk about our SLC devices here. A Couple of things to keep in mind with our SLC devices. Uh, the LED is gonna flash approximately once every four to five seconds, and that's effectively the control panel pulling that SLC loop. Our LEDs are not going to latch on when they're activated. They're going to go into a rapid flash mode, and that flash is going to be approximately four times a second. So it's very obvious that we're in an off normal state. Maximum number of active LEDs is going to be 30 per loop. Uh, but I do want to kind of emphasize what's going on here. That is just on that activation LED. Where this becomes an issue is for test and inspectors or when uh, technicians are commissioning a system. Uh, we'll get a phone call in tech support quite often that, you know, hey, I'm uh, doing a walk test on these 
uh, on the system and I've, I've smoked this detector and I'm not getting that rapidly flashing LED, is my detector bad? Um, and I'm not necessarily gonna say yes or no there, but I do advise those technicians to reset the panel and then retest that detector. It is worth pointing out, you get to that 31st detector, all of the other things based on programming are, are, are going to happen. You know, if your program is written correctly, your horn strobes are gonna go off. If you have relays that need to be activated by that smoke detector, those will fire. All of that will happen. Uh, it's just gonna be those LEDs. We'll only do 30 per loop. And that has to do with some power budgeting uh, that we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, but it has to do with, we had to do some budgeting to, to accommodate some flexibility on our SLD, uh, SLC circuit. Um, if you have a relay and it is activated, that LED will not indicate that activation. And we'll just continue to show that pulling. The relay will change state, but you would need a multimeter to confirm that that relay has changed state. So we're not gonna activate the LED on a relay if it has been picked through zone programming. We've got a couple of different series of detectors here. We've got the pad 100 and 200 series detectors. Those detectors need to be installed on a pad 100 series base. None of our detectors come with bases. You will need to purchase that separately. And that's because there's any number of control functions that we might do with those bases, including sounder bases, relay bases, etc. It's also worth pointing out that these detectors are not multi-criteria detectors. These are multi-element detectors. You'll see there the pad 200 PCHD that is effectively three detectors in one form factor. I've got a smoke detector, I've got a CO detector, and I have a heat detector that I can program to do three separate things. I do want to define what a multi-criteria detector is just so there's no confusion. We might see something like that PCHD as a multi-criteria detector, but that would become an AND statement. The alarm set points are going to be a little bit more sensitive than we would normally expect on those detectors. But for that detector to go into alarm, we would need to see photo and CO and heat. We would need to check all three of those boxes. Again, these detectors are not multi-criteria. They are multi-element. So you'll see there we've got several offerings, including smoke detectors, smoke heat combos, smoke CO combos, etc. We've got a new series of detectors, the pad 300 detectors. Pad 300 detectors must go on a pad 300 base. And the same bullet points apply here. These are multi-element detectors, not multi-criteria detectors. And again, the bases do need to be purchased separately. On the pad 300s, that's our new series of detectors, we have put in a magnet test. Uh, please keep in mind that that is not going to replace that aerosol test. You know, we, we still need to introduce smoke into the chamber of those detectors for commissioning and annual tests and inspections. Also keep in mind, if this were a multi-element detector like the PHD, so a smoke and heat detector uh, combo, if I were to do that magnet test, I'm going to fire both the smoke detector and the heat detector side. I'm going to fire both of those. I don't have the ability to differentiate between the smoke and the heat with that magnet test. So as we go through these detectors, we're gonna uh, talk about the bullet points of the individual elements, and then we'll put them together for those multi-element detectors. Our smoke detectors all have adjustable sensitivity of 1.1% obscuration per foot to 3.5% obscuration per foot. They are defaulted at 3.5%, uh, which is standard, uh, but we do have the ability to turn the sensitivity up on these detectors. 1.1% is notably more sensitive than 3.5%. We do not have the ability to turn the sensitivity down. So 3.5 is gonna be the least sensitive setting, and that is the default, that's industry standard, and 1.1% is a very high sensitivity for that smoke detector. Moving on, there's our heat detector. If it's just a standalone heat detector, we've got an adjustable set point of 135 to 185 degrees Fahrenheit. It can also be programmed as fixed temperature or fixed temperature and rate of rise, rate of rise being 15 degrees Fahrenheit in 60 seconds. 
Our detectors, our heat detectors, have the ability to not only monitor upwardly mobile temperatures, at the same time they can track downwardly mobile temperatures, and we can use them for low temperature signaling as well. So you could put one of these heat detectors into a, an external riser room, uh, and we can monitor that room's low temperature if we're getting too close to being freezing and might potentially you know, burst pipes on a sprinkler or something, or if you've got a dry system. Uh, that low temperature envelope is going to be zero degrees Fahrenheit to 135 degrees Fahrenheit, but they are defaulted at 40 degrees. On the pad, 100 heat detectors, 100 and 200 heat detectors, 135 to 160 degrees Fahrenheit. We had a maximum spacing of 70 foot. 161 to 170, that spacing dropped to 60 foot. And 171 to 185, that spacing dropped to 15 foot. Now, on the pad 300, we have a much better thermistor in them. And so across that entire range, as well as rate of rise, we have a maximum spacing of 70 foot. So much better spacing on those pad 300 detectors. Here's our CO detectors. Um, I, I want to kind of emphasize a couple of things here because I've run into a lot of confusion around CO detectors, CO alarms, etc. So on the pad 100 CD, just the pad 100 standalone CO detector, it has an eight year lifespan. Any of the pad 200 multi-element detectors that include a CO detector, so that would be the PCD, the PCHD, those are gonna have a 10 year lifespan. And any detector with a CO detector in the pad 300 line is going to have a 10 year lifespan. And I wanna talk a little bit about lifespan. If you were to go to Home Depot or Lowe's and buy a CO alarm, you would notice on the back of that detector, there would be an expiration date that would be printed on that. Um, and that's because there's a battery in there. Effectively, that detector, its end of life starts as soon as it comes off of that manufacturing line. On our CO detectors, however, that lifespan has to do with time in service. So if you were to pull a sensitivity report on our panels, you would notice that there's a time in service as well as a life remaining column for those detectors. And that time in service has to do with when that detector is powered up. So if I was to take a pad 300 CD, put it in service for two years, and then take it down, put it back in the box, put it on the shelf for another five years, when I took it back out of that box, it would still have eight years of life remaining because it had only been in service for two years. Uh, it is worth pointing out as well that there is nothing immediate about CO detection. It has to do with CO sustained over time. So our set points are 70 parts per million sustained over two hours, 150 parts per million sustained over 30 minutes, or 400 parts per million sustained over 10 minutes. If you're doing a test and inspect, you can put uh, the control panel into walk test, and when that happens, we drop those timers. So to get that CO detector to trigger, all we've got to do is cross that 30, I'm sorry, 70 parts per million, I apologize, 70 parts per million threshold immediately, and that detector will go into alarm. But that's only going to be during walk test. Now here you'll see we've got a photo heat detector. So I've got two different elements. I've got a smoke detector element and I've got a heat detector element. It is worth pointing out that that heat detector is gonna be locked at 135 degrees. It does not have an adjustable set point. The reason why this is important is a lot of people wanna use these, let's say in an elevator shaft that's sprinkled where we need both a heat detector and a smoke detector. But maybe we don't want that heat detector to be locked at 135 degrees. Maybe we want our set point to be a little higher than that. So please keep that in mind. It's part of these multi-element detectors. We're going to be locked at 135 degrees. And that has to do with the ambient installation temperature of the smoke detector. Again, we get those other bullet points for, uh, it can be programmed for rate of rise on that heat detector. It can also be put into low temperature work as well. So we can do all of those same things that we saw. The only difference is fixed temperature is going to be locked at 135 degrees. We still have that same adjustable sensitivity on the smoke detector that we saw on the standalone photoelectric smoke detector. There's the PCD. I've got a smoke detector element. I've got a CO detector element. I'm able to put both of those in split mode, as you see down there on the bottom of the screen in the software, and I'm able to have those act entirely independently. 
I can have my smoke detector having a sounder base sound a temporal three, and I can have that CO sensor sounding that same sounder base at a temporal four. For those who are going to be here tomorrow, uh, for the software side of things, you will get to see me program those scenarios with that PCD detector. PCHD has got all three of those detectors wrapped up in one form factor. I've got a smoke detector with adjustable sensitivity. I've got a CO detector. And then I've got a heat detector. Again, that heat detector is going to be locked at 135 degrees. I'm not going to get that adjustable set point. Do want to talk about our duct detectors here. The pad 200 or pad 300 duct is just an SLC duct detector. This duct detector does not have a built-in relay and we do not have the ability to directly wire a test switch to this device. Now there is a device, the pad 100 LEDK, that I can use to uh, basically work as a test switch, uh, but it, all it's gonna do is it's gonna fire that logic zone. It is not actually um, going to trip that duct detector. So please keep that in mind. Now the pad 200 or the 300 duct R does have a built-in relay and we do have the ability to directly wire either a pad 100 DRTS four wire supervised remote test switch or an MS series, which is gonna be a two wire unsupervised test switch directly to that detector. However, this detector does require an additional two conductors for 24 volt auxiliary power. And that is simply because the relay has got a very high contact rating on it. It's got 8 amps at 30 volts or 10 amps at 250 volts DC. So if this detector does not have that auxiliary power, it is going to report a DC power trouble. And there's no way to turn that off. But it does have that built-in relay. And it does have the ability to directly wire test switches directly to the device like you would be used to with a conventional duct detector. The pad 300 DD is going to be the replacement head for the duct or the duct R in the 300 series, but it is also listed to be mounted directly into a duct or a plenum. So you could use this head, say, on a relay base for direct damper control if you have an application that requires that. Do you want to talk a little bit about our detector bases? We have a sounder base as well as a low frequency sounder base. The difference between the two there being is that low frequency is going to emit that 520 hertz tone required for sleeping rooms. We also have an addressable relay base as well as an SLC isolator base, a speaker base, and a standard six or four inch detector base. On the 100 series bases, uh, out of the box, the detector head will lock onto the base, and there's a tab that you need to break to disable that feature. I realize that's not optimal, so on the pad 300s, that's exactly the opposite. Out of the box, the detector head does not lock onto the base, but if you do need that locking feature, you will break that shown tab off. The four and the six inch bases are going to be standard detector bases. Um, they'll mount, you know, the four inch base will mount on a three and a half inch octagon box, while the six inch base will mount on double gangs, octagons, four squares, etc. It is worth pointing out that that four inch detector base, while it mounts on a three and a half inch octagon box, will not cover that box. So really, you're probably only going to use that base if you have a hard ceiling, if you have a drywall ceiling, something along those lines. Do you want to talk about our sounder bases? There seems to be um, quite a bit of confusion around Potter sounder bases for people that are new to the Potter product line. So uh, I'll hit a couple of bullet points here. First, the pad 100 sounder base offers 75 decibels at 10 foot. That's going to be that code compliant requirement for the uh, 75 decibels at the pillow. The pad 300, we give you 10 more decibels. So it's going to be a little bit louder than that pad 100 base. Get a little bit more flexibility on where you mount it. Our sounder bases are part of a two-part output. So, of course, we're going to wire SLC to that device. But it's also worth pointing out that there is a separate circuit that needs to be designated as sounder base power, and that can come from either a NAC or an I.O., um, but it has to be designated as sounder base power. Uh, and that circuit is what's going to provide the temporal 3 or temporal four pattern that we would require for smoke detectors, being temporal three, or CO detectors, 
which would require that temporal four. So the circuit itself is what's going to designate that pattern. It's worth pointing out that in, in its idle state, that sounder-based power circuit has correct polarity 24 volts, and that circuit does not require an end-of-line resistor. And that is simply because the sounder bases are monitoring for the presence of power themselves. Uh, that trouble timer is a three-second trouble timer, so they would have to go without 24 volts DC for three seconds, and then they will enunciate that trouble. Uh, that being said, uh, again, that sounder-based power circuit is what's going to pass that temporal 3 or temporal 4 pattern to the sounder base, which will then sound that pattern provided by the circuit. There's the relay base. It's just a form C relay. All of our SLC relays have got the same contact rating. Two amps at 30 volts or half an amp at 120 VAC. Um, that relay base is going to become a subpoint of the detector that's housed on it, much like the sounder base, as I should have mentioned that earlier. It's going to have a subpoint. So we will not actually address this base. We're going to address that detector. And then in the software, we'll put that detector on a relay base or a sounder base, and we'll get a subpoint like you see there on the screen. Low frequency sounder base is going to offer that 520 hertz tone, but it needs to again be on that sounder base power circuit. Now you can put regular sounder bases and low frequency sounder bases on the same circuit because the tone is going to be dictated at the device itself, at the sounder base, where the pattern is going to come from the circuit. It's worth pointing out the pad 100 low frequency sounder base will only mount on a four square box. It only has mounting holes for that four square box, uh, and it's got a fairly decent protrusion on the back, so I'd even recommend potentially putting a box extension on if using those pad 100 low-frequency sounder bases. Now, the pad 300 low-frequency sounder bases is going to be a service mount device, so you will not have that problem. There's our speaker base. You know, so it's gonna. It, this is not an addressable device, so we're gonna have two wires for SLC, and then an additional two wires for that speaker circuit. But the speaker itself is not addressable. We can tap it at 25 or 70 volts, and we've got tappings as low as an eighth of a watt to as high as four watts. And we're gonna maintain a high intelligibility on the output across that entire range. Again, this needs to mount on a four square box, but it, it has the same uh, shell is the pad 100 low frequency sounder base. It looks exactly the same. The difference is this has a speaker where the pad 100 low frequency sounder base is gonna have that driver and the speaker for that 520 Hertz tone. Pad 100 and 300 isolator base is gonna offer SLC short circuit protection and it's gonna have an amber LED that indicates if there is a short on the field side of that base. Do want to talk about all of our modules, the pad 100 PSSA and PSDA are our nice addressable metal pull stations. They just have a miniature input module on the back. Of course, the miniature input module is meant to be mounted inside of a box as opposed to on the face of a box, like the vast majority of the rest of these devices. Pad 100 TRTI has got two relay outputs and potentially two inputs. Now we can put that in class A or class B mode, but we may have four subpoints with that module. Pad 100 OROI offers one relay output and one input, and that can be a very useful module for things like monitoring conventional duct detectors, where we need an input and a mappable relay in the same location. Our dual input module offers me the ability to talk a little bit more about these subpoints. I kind of keep hitting around these subpoints. Normally, we would use a dual input module for sprinkler monitoring. Input one would be a water flow, input two would be a tamper switch. So, just so you understand, on our dual input module, when it's in that split mode, that water flow would report is that address. So, let's say this was at address number nine, the water flow would report is address number nine with the water flow event code, and the tamper switch would also report as address number nine with the appropriate event code for the tamper switch. So both of those devices are going to use that same address to the central station. 
Now, locally in our software, we would see 9.1 and 9.2. We would even see that on our enunciator. We're going to be able to give both of those inputs distinct custom descriptions. But in terms of the behavior to the central station, both of those would report as the same address. So to that point that TRTI has got two relay outputs, two inputs, and we could have all 127 points on our SLC loop be those TRTIs, in which case I would have 254 mappable relays, 254 mappable dry contact inputs, all consuming only 127 SLC addresses. The PAD100 SIM is our single input module. It's the same as a miniature input module with the exception of it mounts on a four square box as opposed to mounting inside of a box. PAD100 RM is our relay module. Again, all of our SLC based relays have got the same contact rating. Two amps at 30 volts DC or half an amp on 125 volts AC. PAD100 ZM is a zone module that we can use for monitoring two wire smoke detector circuits. The PAD100 IM is our isolator module that gives us two protected SLC circuits, protect us from shorts on the SLC circuit. PAD100 LED is going to give us remote visible indication. We might use that for a duct detector, or maybe we've got a line of smoke detectors above a ceiling or below the floor. Any place where there's a code requirement for that remote visible indication, but we can also use it as a supervisory indicator, etc. PAD100 SM is our speaker module. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. PAD100 NAC is our notification appliance module. We would use that in any place where I need a supervised output that's also wet. So, you know, the relay module is just going to be a Form C relay. And the NAC module is going to have a polarity correcting 24 volt supervised output. So we can use that to trigger conventional power supplies. We can use that to trigger visible appliances and ADA rooms. Uh, we could even use that for releasing applications where we need to fire a solenoid. The PAD100 LEDK is an LED output and a key switch input that we can use for several different functions, including NAC disablements, etc. Here's all the settings for those dry contact inputs. By default, virtually all of them are going to come in as pull stations with a few exceptions. So when we get into the software, uh, we're going to have to touch the vast majority of these dry contact inputs because by default, they're going to come in as pull station. Water flow, I think, is pretty self-explanatory, uh, as is supervisory. We have a little bit more specificity on that contact input tamper that is going to come in as a supervisory signal, but there is a separate event code for tamper switches as opposed to just supervisory. We have the ability to remotely trigger a fire drill with that contact input fire drill. Contact input trouble monitor would be just that. If we've got a dry contact that when it goes short, that we want to get a trouble signal as opposed to an alarm or supervisory, we can use that. Quite often this would be used if we've got maybe a smoke control system where we're monitoring for the presence of power on the, for that fan on the smoke control system. Uh, if we lose power, of course, we'd want to enunciate a trouble signal. Contact input aux is kind of a catch-all bucket. It was the predecessor to contact input fire alarm. Abort and release follower are going to be input types used on releasing systems. Contact input reset and contact input silence we could use for custom graphic enunciators, any place where we need to remotely reset and silence our control panel. So like I said, generally we would see that on a custom graphic enunciator. We can disable inputs and we can disable outputs. So that LEDK, we can make that key a disable outputs and map that to a zone with our NAC circuits. And we could use that key switch to disable NAC circuits. Contact input lamp test, of course, would go with those custom graphic enunciators or maybe firefighter smoke control panels. Any place where we need to be able to do a remote lamp test, we can use that input type. CO alarm and CO supervisory are going to be used for monitoring conventional CO detectors. 
Contact input, HVAC restart. That's an interesting input type. Probably not something most people are going to use, but in New York City, there's a very interesting piece of code that says, if a fire alarm control panel shuts down air handler units, resetting the panel shall not return those air handlers to normal service. We need to have a privileged input. So if you're in that situation, you may use that LEDK and make that key switch an HVAC restart input type. When paired with a particular relay type, we will keep that relay from going back to normal until that key switch input or that HVAC restart input, I should say, is triggered. And then we also have several different alert types, medical alert, et cetera. I want to take a second here to talk about our speaker module. You know, you can use this on Potter's new integrated voice systems, um, which I, for anybody who has interest, I will be doing a webinar on Friday on Potter's integrated voice offerings. We can use this module to effectively make sub circuits. So let's say I've got a speaker circuit with uh, that I want to have single station behaviors on. You know, I've got a smoke detector in a room, and I want to only have a speaker sound when that smoke detector goes active. So I could put this module on that speaker circuit, and then I can map those two things together. It is worth pointing out that this does have two input channels, channel one, channel two, but channel one has got that signaling priority. And just the fact that this exists on a speaker circuit, it is going to consume a little bit of wattage. On a 70 volt system, it's gonna consume about a half a watt. And on a 25 volt system, it's gonna consume approximately 1 16th of a watt. Uh, and that is in addition to any speakers that would be on that output side. Pad 100 LEDs, just gonna give us that remote visible indication. It's just an LED output. Pad 100 LEDK, we can use for any number of things. We can disable inputs or outputs. Uh, we can use it as a remote test switch to activate a zone. So I kind of hinted at this earlier with those duct detectors, that pad 200 duct that doesn't have the built-in relay, doesn't have the ability to have a test switch wired directly to it. What I could do, what I would, I, you know, I could put that duct into a zone with a relay and then I could put this LEDK into that same zone and I can make the key switch a supervisory input and that LED could be a general purpose output. Just so you know, a little clarifying statement here. Uh, code does not say anything about remote test switches. What they do say is we would need remote visible indication and we can accomplish that with an SLC device. So that LED would be appropriate for that remote visible indication. That key switch, however, please keep in mind, let's say that my duct detector was at address number one. My relay was at address number two. Of course, this is an SLC device, so I would put my LEDK at address number three. If I turn the key switch, it's address number three that's activating that zone. Of course, my relay is going to change state. My LED is going to activate. But please keep in mind, your central station is going to see address number three and not address number one, which would be that duct detector. Here's the pad 100 notification appliance circuit module. This does require 24 volt auxiliary power and it is going to monitor for the presence of such. So much like that pad duct R, if this device does not have that 24 volt auxiliary power, it is going to enunciate a DC power trouble. This can be wired in class A or class B and there's any number of functions we can use it for. We can use it for you know, let's say ADA rooms in a hotel where we don't want to fire all of our visible appliances. We just want to sign them there locally in that room. Uh, we can use it to release solenoids. We can use it to trigger conventional uh, power booster supplies. But keep in mind, if we're using this for visible appliances, no synchronization is going to be provided or passed through this module. So if we have multiple visual appliances, we would need some sort of synchronization module. SLC device addressing. Um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the capacities. Again, the IPA60 is going to be locked at 60 SLC addresses. AFC50 is going to be locked at 50. The IPA100 will be able to do a full loop of 127 devices, where the AFC and ARC100 are going to be locked at 100 devices. Both of the big panels, being the IPA4000 or AFC1000, can do 127 points out of the box. 
but they are expandable using the Pad 100 SLCE SLC expansion card. And each one of those SLC expansion cards offer an additional 127 SLC points. So our addressing is going to be binary, and that means that the value of each dip switch is going to double, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, and 64. And what that means is we're going to add those numbers together to get our desired address. If you want address number 42, we would turn on the value for 2, 8, and 32, because when those three numbers are added together, we get 42. Again, subpoints. These are all of the modules that have some points on them. You'll see that list there on the left-hand side. It is worth pointing out that sounder bases and relay bases will consume a subpoint of the detector address that's housed on it. So detector number 17 goes onto a sounder base. I would see a subpoint in 17 for that sounder base. So, you know, probably the biggest one we might see there is that PCHD. I would have a subpoint for the smoke detector, subpoint for the CO detector, a subpoint for the heat detector. And if I were to put that onto a sounder base, that address would have four mappable subpoints underneath it. One for the smoke, one for the CO, one for the heat, and finally one for the sounder base. Again, it's worth pointing out that if we're, I'm going to lean on that dual input module. Here you would see it would be address number three. If input one was a water flow, if input two was a tamper, you're going to see that both of those are going to report to the central station at address number three, but with the appropriate event codes. In this case, a 113 for the water flow and 203 would be the event code for the tamper as opposed to a 200, which is just a blanket supervisory. But both of those are going to report on address number three. So if I were defining that point with the central station, I would just call it riser one, because you're going to see riser one event code being either water flow or tamper switch. Again, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to go ahead and continue on here. P-Link devices. It's worth pointing out here, there seems to be a little bit of confusion about P-Link and what it is and what it does. So at a high altitude, P-Link, our P-Link devices, our P-Link circuit, we're gonna use that to expand the capabilities of our control panels. And that'll make more sense here in a second. We're gonna get into a lot more specificity about those P-Link devices. But understand Potter's P-Link is nothing more than RS-485. That being said, We've talked about all the terminals that are on the control panels, and one glaring omission is we do not have a dedicated auxiliary power circuit. Please do not use the P-Link positive and negative as an auxiliary power circuit, simply because if we are powering additional P-Link devices off of that circuit, and we have a device that has got a bad DC rectifier on it, we stand the potential of crashing that communication circuit. And that's because RS-485 is actually a three-conductor circuit, and A and B both reference that negative. So if we draw that down, we may have some unexpected results, or we may just crash that communication circuit entirely. It's worth pointing out that I can make any of my NACs or IOs aux power or even aux resettable power. So please do not use these to power those uh, auxiliary devices. That P-Link voltage is 24 volts, and the maximum wire length is going to be 6,500 foot. Each one of these circuits has a 1 amp rating on it, so please do a P-Link calculation uh, when, you're, when you're building these circuits. On the product pages of any of these panels on pottersignal.com, you will see that there's a P-Link calculator available for use there. But 1 amp is going to be probably the more limiting factor than 6,500 foot. Pad 100 SLCE SLC expansion card pulls 200 mil. So just that single card being on this circuit is going to consume 20% of that available one amp. Now we do have uh, the ability to refresh that one amp, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute. So uh, don't worry about that. But each one of these circuits is going to be limited to one amp. The large panels have two P-Link circuits like you see here. The small panels only have one P-Link circuit.
So let's talk about the devices. UD2000, start off with, you'll notice our panels do not have a built-in DAC. Uh, so if you, were, if you need a phone line dialer, you would need to use this UD2000. So if you're using something like a Telguard, a Starlink, M2M communicator, a communication, a cellular communication device that bluffs that phone line, you would need the UD2000. Uh, most of our devices have the ability to do Class A built in, uh, with the exception of our control panels. Our control panels, you will need an accessory card. The CA6075 is going to be a Class A card for the small control panels. The CA6500 is going to be a Class A card for the large control panels, so the IPA4000, AFC1000. So if you're doing a Class A system, uh, you would need that for the control panel. However, virtually every other device uh, has the ability to do Class A baked in. UD2000, that card's going to slide in behind the enunciator like that. Set screw fastens it to that chassis, and then there's just a little ribbon cable that's going to plug from that card into the main board. CA6075 is a Class A card for the small panels, and it's going to mount over here on the right-hand side of the control board. Again, it is worth pointing out I.O. circuits, even with the Class A card installed, I.O. circuits can only be Class B. This card only provides return terminals for NAC circuits, P-Link, and SLC. Card comes on a metal chassis. Going to highly recommend removing that card from the chassis, installing the chassis on the control panel first, and then installing this card onto that chassis. And that's simply because there's an 18-pin jack there that if you try and put this entire assembly on as one piece, you may bend those pins. Again, you'll use those screws to mount that to the main control board, and then you'll mount that PCB onto that chassis. And there's guide pins there that will keep that card aligned exactly where it needs to be. We do have a couple of remote enunciators. The RA6075 is going to be a two-line 16-character display, where the RA6500 is going to be a four-line 40-character display. It is worth pointing out either of those enunciators can be used with any of these control panels. I am going to highly recommend the RA6500R, uh, simply because it's got that 4x40 display. All of our events display is four lines, and so you're going to have them all displayed right there on the screen as opposed to having to use the down arrow to read the entire event. Uh, there you can see there, there's the entire menu at a glance. And it is worth pointing out here, too, that the R at the end of that part number does not stand for red. It stands for releasing. Uh, our control panels have got indicating lamps for pre-release and release. And code is pretty clear that if we have those indicators on the control panel, they also need to be available on our remote enunciator. So that R stands for releasing, not red. But these do come in red, light gray, dark gray, and black. And as you, what you see here are surface mount versions, but there is also a flush mount version of both of these enunciators. These are not key enable type enunciators. It's just going to be a locked door. So you swing open the door and you're able to get to the buttons. It is worth pointing out on both of these enunciators that there's a checkbox in the software that we can make these read only. So that would disable acknowledge, silence, reset, and drill. And we would just be able to view events through that enunciator if that read only option were checked. The enunciator is going to slide into that box. A couple of screws are going to hold it in. You can see there are any number of mounting options, single gang, four square, 411, et cetera. P-Link wiring is pretty self-explanatory, negative, positive, A and B, and we're just going to maintain that polarity through that whole chain, through that whole P-Link circuit. And of course, we need to address our device, and that device address needs to match what we put in the software when we program this device in. There's our addressing dip switch bank there, and 31 is going to be the highest address that we can do. LED 16 is going to be a 16-zone LED enunciator of alarm, trouble, and supervisory lamps. PSN 1000 is going to be our smart power supply. Each enclosure offers 10 amps of power, 6 NAC circuits if everything's in Class B, and we also have two fully mappable dry contact inputs that do not consume SLC addresses, so you get two free mappable inputs there as well. 
PSN 1000 also has an isolated P-Link repeater. Do you want to talk about a little bit more about these PSN 1000s? We can install up to 31 of these on a system because, again, 31 is going to be the highest address uh, that we can have on a P-Link circuit. 6,500 foot between panels. Uh, we're going to talk about that here in a second. That has to do with that built-in repeater. We can have as many as six class B circuits or as few as three class A, but they are kind of independent. What I mean by that is circuits one and two work as a pair, three and four work as a pair, and then five and six work as a pair. So NACs one and two could be class B. I can make NAC three class A. I would then lose the ability to map four because that would become my return set of terminals for three. And then five and six could be B again. The PSN 1000E is going to be that PSN 1000 power supply, but it's in a larger enclosure. In that enclosure, we have the ability to mount six of those P-Link stacker bracket cards. So we could effectively build out a sub-panel using the PSN 1000E. I didn't mention this on the control panels, but it is worth pointing out. On our control panels, as well as on the PSN 1000, we have the ability to independently program the end of line resistor value for NACs and IOs. Uh, and what we mean by that is NAC1 on the main control panel can be 2K, NAC2 could be 4.7K, uh, NAC3 could be 27K, and that's the envelope 2K to 27K. That's as low and as high as we can adjust those end of line resistor values, but we get that same ability on the PSN 1000 power supply, and we can do that independently there as well on those inputs and the NACs. So you'll notice here the PSN 1000 has the same bullet points that we saw on the control panels when it comes to uh, operating temperature, humidity, etc. PSN 1000 is effectively 17 inches by 16 by three and a half, where the PSN 1000E is gonna be about 10 inches taller. And again, that is so that we have room to mount those P-Link stacker bracket cards inside of the enclosure like you see there. Let's talk about the terminals on the PSN 1000 here real quick. You'll see that we've got our two dry contact inputs over there on the left-hand side. Those will only be class B and they can be any of those input types that we saw earlier. Then we have our, our, our NAC circuits. Again, they work in pairs, one and two, three and four, five and six. Independently, we can make them class A or class B. And each of those circuits has a three amp rating. Moving over from there is our isolated P-Link repeater. And then finally is our main P-Link connection. It is worth pointing out on the PSN 1000, we will always use these terminals. We're always gonna feed the power supply its data here on the main P-Link. But then we can use this repeater to go out to additional P-Link devices. So if we're running out of that one amp of power, we can use those out terminals to refresh that one app and go out to additional P-Link devices. P-Link wiring is pretty self-explanatory in from the control panel out to the next device. But again, if we're running out of that one amp or if we're at that one amp, well, you know, we've kind of hit a wall here. What would we do? Well, I can use those outbound terminals and refresh that one amp or 6,500 foot of wire length uh, on that P-Link circuit. Now, it is also worth pointing out that I don't need to program a device to P-Link 1 or P-Link 2 on a control panel. I don't need to tell the device or the power supply even that it's on that P-Link repeater. Once it's a P-Link device, it's good. We've got our communications and we're just gonna use that repeater here to refresh that one amp of power or 6,500 foot of wire length. MC1000 is a card that we can use for single stream central station reporting. I can make one panel a host and up to 62 additional panels can be client panels and all of those panels can report through that host panel to the central station. However, keep in mind, we do not get any control functions from the host panel to those client panels. And on that host panel, we're gonna get very limited information. We're basically just gonna get zone style information shown on that host panel. Wiring is pretty self-explanatory. We're gonna have a P-Link backbone coming from that host control panel. And then each of these cards can host two client panels on their P-Link. 
So this card, let's say if it was at address number six, may be programmed on three different control panels. It would be programmed on one panel at address six as a host, and on two additional panels as client one or client two at that same address of six. So again, when we talk about it, it's only going to show those general, general zone styles. You can see there in the software, alarm, supervisory, water flow, etc. That zone style is what's going to show on that host panel. Additional P-Link devices, the Pad100 SLCE is our SLC expansion card, and each one gives you a full loop of 127 points. It is worth pointing out this card cannot be installed on any of the small format panels. So it cannot go on the IPA60 or IPA100. It cannot go on the AFC50, AFC100, or ARC100. This card can only be installed on the IPA4000 or the AFC1000. DRV50 is going to give us 50 user configured LED outputs as well as six system level LED outputs. So we could use this for a custom graphic enunciator or on a firefighter smoke control panel. ROY5 is really a expansion card for some of our conventional panels, but we do we can use it. It's a P-Link device and we get five user configured relays with that card. And again, those relays are each independently mappable has a little bit higher of a contact rating than our SLC relays, three amps at 24 volts DC, or three amps at 125 VAC. IDC6 is a card that we can use to monitor two-wire smoke detector circuits, but it is going to require additional power. I apologize about the animations here. I'm just going to scroll through that. FCB1000 is a card that we can use for IP central station reporting only. We're going to add an additional Ethernet port. We're not going to turn off the PCOM port on our main control panel, but this will give us an additional Ethernet port for central station reporting. Um, and there's any number of reasons why we may want to use this, primarily being uh, that we may be more than certifiable CAT5 length away from that modem and router, um, you know, 328 foot or 100 meters. I think the other and probably more pragmatic reason would be that any time that we take that alarm signal and we go on to a customer piece of equipment, that switch gear, that all becomes part of the critical path. So any piece of equipment that signal may go through to get to that modem and router, in other words, the internet at large, needs to be provided with standby power. And that can be a fairly big lift. So we might use this FCB1000 to get that ethernet port as close as possible to that modem and router where we have much, much less devices that we need to give that standby power to. The FIB1000 is a card that allows us to convert that four wire P-Link RS45 from copper to and from fiber optic cables. So if we've got a multi-building campus where we're going from building to building off a single control panel, we may wanna use this to traverse from one panel to the next as opposed to putting copper underground, et cetera. There's any number of logistical issues we may have there uh, where fiber is gonna be much more desirable for between buildings. SPG 1000 is a serial and parallel printer card uh, that primarily I would, I would say we would see on smoke control systems. There is a code compulsion for printer on systems doing smoke control and that SPG 1000 will offer us that ability to print that. A couple of cards come in a 19-inch rack mount, FIB1000, FCB1000, and the SPG1000 are available in the stacker brackets or in a 19-inch rack mount like seen here. So speaking of those stacker brackets, you can see why they're called stacker brackets, and it's because the, the, those P-Link cards come on these brackets that we can stack. Depending on the enclosure, we might be able to go as high as three and two wide. So the IPA 4000 or AFC 1000, we have the ability to mount six P-Link cards in there on these stacker brackets, three high, two wide. PSN 1000E has that same capability. You can see here, there's the PSN 1000E with a card in it, and to the left is an AFC 1000 with a stacker bracket card in it. A couple of accessory enclosures, not much to say about those. Those are just empty enclosures that will hold additional cards. So we could build out sub panels using these accessory enclosures or the PSN 1000E. 
So I want to talk a little bit about P-Link capacity. The small panels, we're going to be locked at 64. The large panels, we're going to be able to do 128 P-Link devices. Most cases, we're going to be limited to 31, and that's going to be the highest address that we can have. FIB 1000 is that card that takes our P-Link to and from fiber. So, of course, we're going to install that in pairs. We'd be limited to 30 there. LED 16, DRV 50. On the small format panels, we're going to be locked at 10, and that has to do with power consumption. FCB 1000 or the UD 2000 are communication cards, and, of course, we would only ever put one of those on a control panel. Uh, the, the, the addressing is, again, binary, much like we saw on our SLC detectors. But it is worth pointing out, you know, kind of some, something that causes some confusion here is if I can do 64 P-Link devices on a small panel or 128 on a large and 31 is my highest address, you know, it, it, that really doesn't seem to line up. So here's the deal. I can have multiple distinct devices at the same address, and my system is smart enough to know the difference between those device types. So what I'm trying to say is I can have a UD2000 at address number one, I can have a remote enunciator at address one, I can have a PSN1000 at address number one, and I'm gonna be just fine. The system is gonna know that those are distinct device types at that address. What I cannot have is three PSN1000s all at address number seven. I would have to have those on separate addresses because they're the same device type. Again, it's binary addressing. So one, two, four, eight, and 16 are gonna be the value of the dip switches. And then we add those numbers together to get the desired uh, address. Again, I'm not seeing any questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and keep going on here. Output circuit configuration. Small panels may have a total of four outputs over two NACs and two IOs if both of those IOs are programmed as outputs. Again, NACs have a three amp rating, IOs have a one amp rating. NACs can be made class A on a control panel with a class A card, but IOs will only be class B. Those small format control panels only have a five amp power supply, where the large control panels have a 10 amp power supply. Those large panels may have a total of six outputs over six NACs and four IOs. PSN 1000 is going to be that intelligent power supply, and it may have as many as six Class B NAC outputs. 10 amp power supply, but this has to be paired with an AFC or an IPA panel. So this is going to wire on the P-Link. That P-Link is going to provide communication as well as synchronization on that four wire circuit, as well as report back troubles with a high level of specificity to that control panel. So panel number 17, NAC circuit four is in trouble. We're going to see that spelled out on our enunciator. All right, so again, uh, adjustable end of line resistor value, but 5.1K is our default. I do want to talk about the designation for each of these circuit types. NAC general purpose is just going to be a polarity correcting 24 volts. There will not be any synchronization attached to that circuit. Aux constant and aux resettable are going to be circuits that do not require an end of line resistor. But of course, aux constant is just going to provide 24 volts DC, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Nothing will cause that circuit to change its state. Aux resettable will do the same thing with the difference being that that will drop power when the panel's in a reset cycle. So if we've got four wire smoke detectors or conventional duct detectors that we are powering, of course, we would want to use a resettable circuit as opposed to a constant circuit. We can do door holders with our NACs and IOs. Uh, low holder AC drops. So if our panel loses AC, we can set a timer for how long do we hold those door holds open before we just fail safe and close those doors. Aux ANSI is the predecessor to sounder-based power. Um, not something I would expect most people to use, but it's putting out a temporal three uh, nonstop. Nothing makes it change its state. It's just a temporal three all the time. City tie is not something many people use. Um, if, if, if you do city tie, you're familiar with what it is and uh, it's nice that we have that output city tie type. 
Again, sounder based power does not require an end of line resistor. In its idle state, it has correct polarity 24 volts because the sounder bases are monitoring for the presence of that power. But that circuit through software programming can be set up to do a temporal three or temporal four pattern. Release solenoid, of course, we would use on releasing systems and synchronized horn strobe circuits. One of the neat things that Potter has is a technology called QuadraSync. On a single control panel, I have the ability to have one circuit doing system sensor appliances, another circuit doing Gentex appliances, a third doing Amseco, and a fourth doing wheel lock, and all of the strobes on that panel are going to synchronize together. We do that through a technology called QuadraSync. Wiring the outputs is pretty self-explanatory. Class B, of course, requires an end-of-line resistor. Or class A, we would return that circuit to the class A card on a control panel and we would not use a resistor. This is just to show that in our software, we are gonna touch each one of these circuits independently and we're going to assign it a function. So here you'd see we've got a couple of synchronizations on NAC1 and NAC2. I do a door holder circuit on three, constant power on four, et cetera. But I'm gonna to touch each one of those circuits independently and I'm gonna map each one of those circuits independently in my programming software. Same holds true on the IOs. We're gonna to touch each one of those. They can be inputs or outputs. We're gonna program each one of those independently. We're gonna map each one of those independently. Again, on our power supplies, PSN 1000, we're gonna have that same thing. We're gonna see each one of those circuits available as a, as a distinct point in the software, and we're going to assign it the appropriate function. We will then map that function in the zone program as needed. I do wanna talk a little bit about our relay outputs here. Uh, general purpose relay is what we're going to use for most applications, but please keep in mind that based on zone rules, that general purpose relay is a silenceable relay type. So if we hit the silence, if that's in a silenceable zone and we hit that silence button, that relay would return to the normal state. HVAC shutdown is a relay type that when paired with the HVAC restart key, that relay will not return to normal on a panel reset. It'll stay off normal until the input from that HVAC restart input. That being said, if that input, if that HVAC restart is not in the zone with this relay type, of course it will return to normal on a reset. That relay type is intrinsically non-silenceable. So keep that in mind, it is a non-silenceable relay type. So if you're doing air handle or shutdown work, there's nothing wrong with using that relay type. Zone trouble relay type is really not one I would expect most people to use, um, but I'll lay out a scenario. If I had 100 smoke detectors in a zone with a relay programmed as a zone trouble, and one of those detectors went dirty, of course, I would have a dirty detector trouble, and then that relay would change state because I have a trouble in the zone. If one of those detectors went into alarm, that relay would stay normal because obviously it's an alarm, it's not in trouble. And finally, reset follower is a relay type. Um, it does have to go into a zone because it's an SLC type, but the only time that relay is going to change state is if the panel is in a reset cycle. So let's say there was a duct detector that's being powered in the air handler unit, and we want to be able to reset power to that detector when we reset our control panel. We may put a relay designated as reset follower up there into that air handler unit, and then you know normally closed and common, uh, you know on one of the power legs. So if we reset the panel, it goes open. We drop power to that device. And then of course it would close back up again after the reset cycle device gets powered and returns to normal. So we would use that to you know, help power cycle devices, et cetera, but that relay is only gonna change state if the panel's in a reset cycle. Input circuit configuration. Again, we talked about all of these, so I'm not gonna read through this entire list again, but any of our dry contact inputs, SIM, DIM, MIM, IOs on a control panel, inputs on a PSN 1000, any of those inputs can be designated as anything on this list. Any of our dry contact inputs have got 
Uh, circuit listing that says we cannot exceed 100 ohms on the field wiring or 10,000 wire feet. Again, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to go ahead and continue on. PCOM network connection. So it's worth pointing out that we are only going to be able to program a Potter AFC or IPA panel using a laptop with Windows 10 in our programming software. We cannot get an effective program through the keypad. We can run a learn, but there's a couple of things that you need to keep in mind about the learn. All of our dry contact inputs, we don't know what they are. So the vast majority of them are going to be designated as pull stations. We also don't know what kind of behaviors you want to do. So everything's going to go into zone one. We cannot alter any of those characteristics through the keypad. So we need to have the software. So you need to have a laptop with an Ethernet port. Now that port does not need to be built into the computer. You can have a USB to Ethernet dongle and that's going to work just fine. And then we're going to use a Cat5 cable. So of course we're going to plug that cable into the in, into our laptop and then we're going to program you plug it into the PCOM port on the control panel. When we do that, uh, keep in mind there's a couple of things here. I'm going to kind of take a sidebar here. We are networking, quote unquote, with this panel. There are two th different thoughts in networking, and I think that's probably the wrong way to put it, but DHCP is Dynamic Host Command Protocol, and that means that my device does not have an IP address, and it is reliant on something else on the network to give it an IP address. By default, our control panels are set up DHCP, so you would need to set your laptop's Ethernet adapter for DHCP as well. You can also program the panel to have a static IP address, which means that it always has the same IP address. Um, that's not a problem, but keep in mind if you're going onto a customer's network, you need to talk with their administrator and have them give you an address before you just assume that you can use a certain address because you may run into IP conflicts if you plug a static IP address into your control panel. So normally, our panels are probably not going to be on a customer network. So we would uh, plug our laptop's Cat5 cable into the panel, into the laptop, and then the process is going to take somewhere between 30 and 45 seconds. That panel is asking, your, it's going to recognize that there's a connection. It's asking your laptop if it can be given an IP address. And of course, your laptop is not able to assign an IP address. So eventually it's going to recognize that it's not able to, and that control panel is going to go into what's known as link local mode. It'll flash link local on the screen like you see here, and then it's going to advertise an IP address of 169.254.150.70, and that's standard across all Potter panels. So once we've done that and we, that connection is established, we can send and retrieve programs from the control panel at will. That's an important distinction, being able to send a program without doing anything on the enunciator because of that link local connection. That is important to remember because we can also go on to a customer's network where in that case, there's a very good chance that there is a DHCP server. So when we plug that panel into the customer network much more rapidly than that 30 to 45 seconds, we're gonna see the panel say, obtaining IP, IP configured, and then it's going to flash that IP address. It is worth pointing out that this is only going to flash for a couple of seconds, but if you're at the top menu on our control panel, whether directly connected or on a customer network, we can always press the right arrow on the enunciator and it'll show us the panel's IP address. Now, we can always retrieve a copy of the program without having to do anything at the control panel. But when we go to send a program to the panel, I need to enable remote access. Because once you're on that customer network, I don't know where in the world you're at. You could have VLAN access, there's any number of things that could be going on where you might not be local to that customer site. And code is very clear that if we make programming changes, we need to test those programming changes. So when we're not in that link local mode, I need to have fingers on buttons on that local enunciator to put the panel into remote access mode. Once we have internet, we can do uh, central station communication via IP. 
And there are a couple of bullet points I want to talk about with IP communication. NFPA says it is listed for sole path. And basically, once we get to the internet at large, um, it's called the web for a reason. There's virtually limitless ways for us to get from uh, our control panel to that central station receiver. There's not going to be any sort of single point of failure. One of the interesting things about uh, IP communication is this thing called a checksum. At the end of every data packet, uh, the control panel will say something along the lines of, I sent you 165 bits. And the receiver will say, well, I only got 150. That's going to prompt the control panel to send that entire data packet again to make sure that everybody gets the correct message. Um, if that checksum checks out, if it says I sent you 165 bits and the receiver says I got 165 bits, then we know the right information was sent and we're not going to resend that. Uh, the speed of the Internet allows those signals to be delivered virtually instantaneously. You know, we can hit a pull station in Los Angeles, have it go to a central station in New York, and back to monitoring software in Los Angeles as quick as the snap of a finger. Where, you know, when we were doing analog communication, you know, contact ID, something like that, or phone lines, each one of those signals may take up to three seconds for the panel to send it and for that receiver to recognize that signal. The bottom bullet point does require a little bit of explanation. Loss of communication between the control panel and your central station is known within 90 seconds of using the default program time. So I want to zoom out just a little bit here so you understand this. Every 20 seconds, the control panel is going to send a message to the receiver that says, I'm here, and the receiver is going to answer, I hear you. It's a simple call and response. This 90 seconds has to do with how long do we let that process fail before we generate a communication trouble at both the control panel and at the central station because both are expecting that check-in. Code says we can push this out as far as one hour or 3,600 seconds. So I'm gonna highly recommend that you check with your central station for what that supervision interval should be. 90 seconds is purposely too low. We'd rather generate unnecessary communication troubles and prompt that conversation with your central station that assume that it should be set at one hour. Some central stations are half an hour. Some are going to be 15 minutes. The vast majority in my experience are at one hour. But please ask your central station what that communication supervision interval needs to be set for. A couple of things to consider. Again, our uh, con connection is going to be going through customer equipment, and so now we need to provide it with standby power. So the less equipment, the better. That's why I like that FCB 1000. I can have my modem, my router, maybe a little one terabyte uh, switch right there uh, where I'm, I'm very close to that uh, public side of the Internet connection right there. And I've got several, you know, small current draw devices with which to provide the standby power as opposed to multiple full network switching racks. On the cost associated with IP versus other formats, I mean, where can you go anymore where there's not internet in the building? It's very few and far between. Um, though I do realize if you're doing new construction, you know, everybody's waiting on us for the CO uh, and, you know, the internet guy is generally the last one in the door. So please keep that in mind. Our control panels are compatible with SureGuard IP receivers, which are the gold standard. It's worth pointing out, most people probably don't realize this, that if you're doing cellular communication, at the end of the day, you're actually doing IP communication to your central station most of the time. That communicator, that cellular communicator, is relaying that signal over cellular to a network operations center, which is then relaying that over IP to your central station. For the most part, there are times when it may be over phone lines, but that is exceedingly rare. So one of the other neat things is out of the box, our panels are able to send and receive emails. This is not a subscription. You don't need to buy anything. But if we have internet on that PCOM port, again, this is not the FCB 1000 port. That's going to be for central station reporting only. Uh, but we're not turning off the PCOM port. So if we get an internet drop to that, we can send and receive emails with our control panels. Every panel has a built-in email address, and it's going to be the netbios at potterlink.com. So you'll see on the heat sink over there on the right-hand side, IPA60, etc., um, at potterlink.com. So we in the, in the software, we have an email reporting screen. 
Uh, we can do status emails. We can schedule reports. We can even enable email requests. Status emails are going to be alarm trouble, supervisory, et cetera, and they're going to be sent when the condition occurs. Depending on how rapidly those conditions are coming into the control panel, that email may contain more than one line item in it. So maybe a pole station, a smoke detector, et cetera. There's an example of an emailed system status. You know, AFC 1000 1783 that, that I have no frame of reference for that. So in the software, there is a job details tab that we can fill out some fields, and that's going to be written into this email. Training cell number eight at Potter Electric in St. Louis, that gives me a frame of reference. I know what panel that is. You can see down here, we've got multiple events that came, came in. The pull station was pulled at 8.28 and 22 seconds, and five seconds later, the system was silenced. We can schedule history and detector status reports daily, weekly, or monthly, and it's going to be attached to that email as a text and an Excel file. Um, I'm a big advocate for our reports, both history and detector status, um, and I like this feature, but I think there might be a better uh, case for it here in just a moment. That's going to be emailing service reminders. That's a separate tab on the software, and we can send these emails to up to 20 different email addresses, and we can write our own message in the body of the email and attach a history and a detector status report to it. Personally, I like using these for annual test and inspection reminders. Um, you know, you attach the history and the, the, the detector status because I want to equip that technician for the best possible outcome. When I look at that history report, if I've got all of my 4,000 events in the history buffer that are written within the last six months, I'm probably going to have a fairly heavy uh, service lift out there. I've got a very active panel. However, if, you know, five items have been written last year, I've got a pretty healthy panel. Now, on that detector status report, the nice thing about that is I can see if I've got detectors that are nearing a dirty detector status, so I can be preemptive. I can clean those detectors. And I can also see if I have CO detectors that are nearing their end of life. So again, it gives me that actionable intelligence to set that test and inspect up for the best possible outcome. I might reach out to the customer and say, oh, we've got five detectors that are getting close to being dirty. We've got a couple of CO detectors that are nearing their end of life that need to get replaced. And we can open that service call before we even do the test and inspect so that we have the best possible outcome. We can also send an email to the panel, but it needs to be from a pre-programmed email address. So I'm going to recommend not using a named account. Don't use jamesb at pottersignal.com because if I were to leave, you know, who's going to be able to access that email account and send that panel an email? So you may want to use a shared account. Service at abcfire.com might be more appropriate. In the subject line, we can put configuration, status, or history. And within about 10 minutes, we'll receive those requests back. We can get a current panel history, a, a sensitivity report, or even the current panel program. And the reason why I say 10 minutes is the panel is going to check for email every five minutes, and then there may be some latency in us receiving that email. In my opinion, this can become very, very useful for those middle-of-the-night calls. You know, a customer calls you and says, my alarm panel is going off at 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, you have the ability to request a history report from that panel and see if it's actually going off or if it's maybe a low battery. And you can advise your customer appropriately based on that email that you just got back from the control panel. For additional questions about the Potter product, please contact technical support at the phone number or email address shown on the screen. And as always, don't forget to follow us on social media.